Today we're going to perform a quick experiment. We're going to look at the effects of changing temperature on refractive index. To do this test, I have a Rudolph J457 refractometer, and I have four different types of sample. I have water, cranberry juice, ethylene glycol or antifreeze, and engine oil. I'm going to start by measuring all these samples at 20 degrees Celsius. The first sample I'll do is distilled water. I place the sample on the prism. I have the smart measure setting to auto start. The instrument detects that the sample is there and starts to bring it to 20 degrees Celsius. I've got it set to delay 30 seconds to make sure it's exactly at 20 degrees. When that delay time is up, it will then read and display the results on the screen. Now that I've completed the measurement, I'll wipe away the sample. The instrument has been designed with a very shallow sample well to make it very easy to clean. The smart measure system detects that the sample is gone, blanks the main reading, the readings are still kept here, and now we know it's ready for the next sample. Our next sample is cranberry juice. Once again, I just repeat the process. Place some cranberry juice on the prism. And wait for the instrument to measure. If I wanted to, I could also close the lid. This is very important if the sample is highly evaporative. For a material like cranberry juice measured at 20 degrees C, the evaporation is not very high, and so I can just leave the lid open. We can actually check on the importance of whether the lid is open or closed by looking at our results. We can see that all three results were the same, so we know that there's no significant evaporation going on. Clean off the cranberry juice, wipe any last traces off with distilled water. The next sample uses a glycol, antifreeze. Place it on the prism, wait till the instrument detects the samples there. It will bring it to temperature and then it will measure. Now we wipe the glycol off, clean the prism, place engine oil on. Once again, the engine oil will be put to 20 degrees Celsius and measured. At the completion of this, we'll have our baseline. We'll have an understanding of what these four samples should measure at 20 degrees Celsius. My next step will be to set the instrument for 25 and repeat the process. Very commonly, people measure at room temperature, but what is room temperature? 20 to 25 is probably a reasonable variation in a normal air-conditioned room. So let's see what effect that variation has. As you can see, the difference is quite significant. In many samples, we have errors well into the third decimal place. We've completed our study at 20, 25, and 25 with temperature correction. And if we look, the quick summary is, with water, we got a number at 20, we got a very different number at 25. We got an error, in fact, of about five in the fourth decimal place. When we switched on temperature correction, we got the same result we did at 20, which proves that with a water sample, temperature correction works well. We also tried a beverage, in this case, cranberry juice. Once again, 20, big variation to 25 degrees, but with temperature correction switched on and the sample temperature stable, the temperature correction removed the error and the system gave a reasonable result. This is not surprising because cranberry juice is mostly sugar and this is what temperature correction is designed to work with. The story becomes very, very different though when we move to a chemical, in this case antifreeze or glycol. We have a number we have a very large error when we measure that number. Even a small difference, even the difference between 20 and 25C has given us variation in the third decimal place. When we put temperature correction on, yes, it does something to help, but we're still left with a very large error in the fourth decimal place. The final sample we did was engine oil, and this shows the effect even more so. Once again, reading at 20, reading at 25, very large difference, almost two in the third decimal place. We put temperature correction on, 
Yes, it helps a little, but we're still left with an error that is almost in the third decimal place. And that's just from what we would call room temperature, 20 to 25 degrees. The amount of variation we would expect in an air-conditioned laboratory. Our initial checks were what happens at room temperature or the changes within room temperature. But as a final thing, we've taken a look at what might happen in the real world in an industrial environment. I've taken some measurements here at 60 degrees Celsius. Now 60 degrees Celsius or about 140 degrees Fahrenheit is a fairly typical temperature that a sample might be processed at. Something that a juice might be pasteurized or a juice might be at after pasteurization. It's the sort of temperature that may be a common process temperature in a chemical company. And we can look down and we can see these differences. We have some dramatic differences. Differences in the second decimal place between measuring at room temperature and measuring at 60 degrees. Clearly, if one is going to measure a process sample, one has to do something about the temperature of that sample before one can take any meaningful readings.